We often ask ourselves why don't they teach us at school about taxes, how the job market works, is our educational system designed to provide us with useful knowledge or is it designed to shape obedient citizens who won't question anything? Today we will dive into the impact of anti-intellectualism in the society and our education. Let's start off with an example. This is an excerpt from a parent's response to a teacher's complaint about modern education's relaxed standards. The parent strongly supports our more non-academic approach to education. When I entered the school, there was no welcome on the mat. Nobody greeted me, and the hallway was gloomy with closed classroom doors. I asked a passing student for directions and then knocked on the intimidating classroom door. I introduced myself to the teacher with a friendly smile. She seemed to know why I was there and quickly grabbed her class book, like a character in a movie reaching for a gun. In the class book, there were lists of students' names with little marks and symbols I didn't understand. The teacher's finger moved down the page and my child's marks were different from the others. She looked at me triumphantly as if that settled everything. I was thinking about how my lifeless child, whole life and personality were reduced to these marks. I wanted to understand my child's overall progress, but the teacher only cared about numbers. I left feeling uninformed and uneasy. We're not all the same and we don't enjoy the same things. In our current education system, students are just numbers and your only task is to learn by heart, pass the exam and forget about what you learned within weeks. When adults recognize this, everyone will be happier and schools will be more pleasant places to learn. In everyday language, we often associate intellect with certain jobs like writers, critics, professors, scientists, journalists, etc. Some say an intellectual is someone who carries a briefcase, as Jacques Barzon once remarked. Carrying a briefcase is linked to the status and role of intellectuals. However, not everyone in these professions is necessarily an intellectual in the true sense. In many professions, having a sharp mind can be helpful, but being intelligent is usually enough. We have observed that not all academics are intellectuals, and that's sometimes disappointing. The difference between intellect and professionally trained intelligence isn't tied to entire professions. It's about individual people. To understand what makes someone an intellectual, we need to figure out what sets apart, for example, a professor or a lawyer who is considered an intellectual to someone who isn't an intellectual. The distinction isn't about the kind of ideas they deal with, but how they approach those ideas. In some way, an intellectual lives for ideas, which means they are deeply committed to the life of the mind, almost like a religious dedication. Intellect is the thoughtful, creative, and reflective part of our mind. Intelligence helps us understand, manipulate, and organize things while intellect encourages us to think, reflect, question, imagine and criticize. We can appreciate intelligence in animals, but when it comes to humans, intellect is seen as both admirable and criticized. This distinction helps us understand why we might describe a highly intelligent person as not very intellectual and vice versa why intellectual people can have varying levels of intelligence. The heart of the matter, to borrow a distinction made by Max Weber about politics, is that the professional man lives off ideas, not for them. His professional role, his professional skills, do not make him an intellectual. He is a mental worker, a technician. He may happen to be an intellectual as well, but if he is, it is because he brings to his profession a distinctive feeling about ideas which is not required by his job. As a professional, he has acquired a stock of mental skills that are for sale. The skills are highly developed, but we do not think of him as being an intellectual if certain qualities are missing from his work. At home, he may happen to be an intellectual, 
but at his job he is a hired mental technician who uses his mind for the pursuit of externally determined ends. Human beings are tissues of contradictions, and the life even of the intellectual is not logic, says Holmes, but experience. It is part of the intellectual's tragedy that the things that he values in himself aren't actually as appreciated by the society. Society values him because he can in fact be used for a variety of purposes, from popular entertainment to the design of weapons. One reason why anti-intellectualism has changed in our time is because our view of the usefulness of intellect has evolved. In the 19th century, when business values dominated Western culture, and many successful people didn't have much formal education, academic schooling was often seen as pointless. Back then, education was considered a means for personal advancement, and it was thought that practical life experiences were better for learning. Pursuits related to intellect and culture were seen as too theoretical, unmanly, and not practical. You can stick a public school and a university in the middle of every block of every city, and you will never keep a country from rotting morally by mere intellectual education. Also, low salaries and lack of appreciation for teachers. Not giving them space and creativity to teach their students is a big problem. They need to stick to a certain curriculum all the time and use the same methods of judging or giving scores to students despite them having different needs and skills. On the other hand, students don't pay a lot of attention during the lectures or they involve themselves in inappropriate things which can be harmful to their mental, emotional or physical health. Moral standards of yesterday to many individuals are no standard for today unless supported by the so-called intellectuals. I believe that partial education is far worse than no education at all, especially if we will only educate the mind without the soul. Turn that man loose upon the world who has no power higher than his own. He is a monstrosity. He is but halfway educated and is more dangerous than though he were not educated at all. But in any case, following your heart and sticking to traditional principles and morality can be way better than sticking to principles which are ever-changing and, for example, something used to be wrong before but now it has completely changed and it is considered right, and this can cause a lot of confusion. Even in basic education, a system that emphasizes memorizing facts rather than nurturing physical and emotional growth can be harsh and may harm society's well-being. Being said, emotional intelligence is as important as intellectual intelligence. Emotional intelligence refers to um, how well we handle ourselves and our relationships, the four domains, uh, self-awareness, knowing what we're feeling, why we're feeling it, which is a basis of, for example, good intuition, good decision-making. Uh, also, it's a moral compass. Uh, the second part is um, self-management, which means handling your distressing emotions in an effective way so that they don't cripple you, they don't get in the way of what you're doing, and yet attuning them to them when you need to so that you learn what you must. Every emotion has a function. Also, marshalling positive emotions, getting ourselves, uh, you know, uh, involved, enthused about what we're doing, uh, aligning our actions with our passions. The third is empathy, knowing what someone else is feeling. And the fourth is putting that all together in skilled relationship. Being emotional and sensible don't make a person less rational. They should go hand in hand. A key point in Ellul's argument is that modern propaganda relies on education, which flips the common belief that education protects us from propaganda. Instead, he argues that education, as it's commonly practiced today, is a necessary foundation for propaganda. Essentially, it's the groundwork for propaganda, conditioning people with a lot of disorganized information that's given to them for hidden purposes and presented as facts and education. 
Hallel goes on to suggest that intellectuals are particularly susceptible to modern propaganda for three reasons. First, they absorb a lot of unverifiable information from second-hand sources. Second, they feel a strong need to have an opinion on important issues making them vulnerable to propaganda's influence. And third, they believe they can judge information independently even though they often rely on propaganda. Hawthorne, in a passage near the end of the Blythedale romance, observes that nature's highest purpose for man is that of conscious intellectual life and sensibility. If we view the mind as a helpful source of emotional guidance, if we treat our intellect as not always a character guarantee or as a threat, and if we view theory as something which is valuable and useful and not less important than practice, then we wouldn't have this kind of conflicts. Emotional intelligence is as important as intellectual intelligence. As we know, our educational system is not at its best shape and we need to respect and always encourage our children or the students who have different needs, skills, to reach their goals and not to always punish them and always discourage them because they cannot be very good at mathematics or they cannot be good at physics, but we need to be more supportive and helpful of them. Also, an intellectual who has good character and good ethics is more valuable than an intellectual who lacks character. So what do you think? Is our educational system getting worse? Are our intellectuals doing a good job? Or are they trying to transmit a specific agenda to our children? Leave a comment down below in the comment section. Thank you for watching and I will see you in the next one.